One of the most famous ideas of George Orwell's 1984 is the concept of Room 101, where each enemy of the state of Oceania is subjected to the thing that they fear the most, to the absolute worst nightmare they can ever dream of. Now, that presupposes that each prisoner of Room 101 is approached in an extremely tailor-made fashion. For each of them, the police have to find out the specific thing that they would fear the most. Each prisoner is seen as an individual who has their own life story and their own specific fears. But if we take this novel to be an allusion to the Soviet Union, which it very likely is, at least partly, then the idea of Room 101 is simply not true. The criticism towards this concept by George Orwell was first put forward by George Shevelov, the Ukrainian linguist and essayist who had direct experience with the Soviet repressive system, having lived in the Union for almost 20 years and having witnessed the examination of most of outstanding Ukrainian intellectuals, writers and artists by the Soviet regime in the 1930s. Now, what he writes about the concept of Room 101 is that it simply doesn't work like that. There is no individual approach towards the suspects. The system doesn't care what the suspect's biggest fear is, because it sees everyone as the exact same person, with the exact same kind of thinking, and as a result, the same methods can be applied towards everyone. As an example, Shevelov tells the story of one of his friends, who was a professor of Ukrainian studies in the USSR. At one of the interrogations by the Soviet secret services, he was told, we know that you are a Ukrainian nationalist. We know, for example, that you have ignored the revolutionary democratic work of Shevchenko, but have spoken positively about the bourgeois nationalist writings of Panik Kulish. The professor had to confess. Yes, indeed, he was a Ukrainian nationalist. Yes, indeed, he had ignored the revolutionary democratic work of Shevchenko. And yes, indeed, he had spoken positively about the bourgeois nationalist writings of Panik Kulish. The problem was, however, that he had never written about or given lectures on Shevchenko or Kulish. He was accused for the sole reason that NKVD thought that everyone who was doing Ukrainian studies must necessarily be a Ukrainian nationalist and have certain critical opinions towards Marxism. And he confessed precisely because everyone is supposed to confess and repent when they are accused of something, or else they get into much bigger trouble. This leads us to another point which Orwell apparently gets wrong. In 1984, the reason why Winston Smith is arrested is because he was doing apparently illegal activities according to the laws of Oceania, criticizing the authorities, reading the forbidden books and plotting against the state. But in the Soviet Union, you didn't necessarily have to go against the state to be arrested. In fact, you could be a huge supporter of the regime and be arrested nonetheless, just as it happened with hundreds of people during the Great Purge and even before or after that. That was the case precisely because the Soviet Union did not like to differentiate or see how each individual case was specific, which also led George Shevelov to write that the whole of the Soviet Union was Room 101. Everything was the same for everybody, and it was precisely this that was most frightening. This isn't, however, the only problem with how dystopian novelists interpret totalitarianism. This apparently false idea of an individual approach towards criminals also implies that the relation between the police officer and the criminal is of a purely intellectual kind, because on the one hand, the officer is supposed to figure out the criminal, follow him, use deduction, ask the right question at the right times, etc., whereas the criminal is supposed to deceive the officer so that he doesn't figure out the criminal or understand their motives. This kind of intellectual struggle is what happens on the pages of Orwell's novel, as well as on the pages of Arthur Kessler's 1940 novel Darkness at Noon, one of the first and most famous works that reflect on the nature of the Soviet Union. In that novel there is a man called Rubashov, who is also accused of a state crime and who is being interrogated by the man Gladkin from the Soviet secret police. Now, the struggle between these two is never physical. All Gladkin wishes is to convince Rubashov that he has committed a crime and that he needs to confess. Rubashov asks about his approach. I was told that you were a partisan of certain drastic methods, the so-called hard method. Why have you never used direct physical pressure on me? You mean physical torture, said Gladkin in a matter-of-fact tone. 
As you know, that is forbidden by our criminal code. And in the novel, it is, indeed, Gladkin never even touches Rubashov. He operates purely on a psychological level, which is a pretty scary thing if we think about it. Manipulating someone by mistreating them physically is something that everyone has heard of, but getting into the mind of the person is quite terrifying, which also makes the novel quite thrilling to read. We can find many more examples of this, the first of which would probably be Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, where the investigator Porfiry Petrovich kinda knows Raskolnikov is the criminal, but he doesn't arrest him, he wants to convince Raskolnikov to confess, to convince him that he has not been right about his ideas and his right for manslaughter. This struggle at the level of ideas is what makes the novel quite interesting to read, but it's also what contributes towards the creation of one huge myth that many people still believe nowadays, and which consists of two aspects. The first aspect of the myth is that it supposes that the criminal is never doing the crime just for the sake of the crime itself, there's always some idea behind it. And the second aspect is that the police in totalitarian societies supposedly operate purely at the level of ideas and persuasion and intellect. Now, both of these are mostly just literary myths. The criminal can very often be doing crimes just for the sake of crimes themselves, and totalitarian police are not really a bunch of intellectuals writers think them to be. We can see that from the many memoirs and autobiographical books of the people who have lived through totalitarian prisons. One such example is the novel The Garden of Gethsemane by the Ukrainian emigrant Ivan Bahriani, who describes how Soviet prisons operated in the 1930s. Now, YouTube is not going to allow me to describe that in much detail because it's quite shocking, but what he shows is that in those prisons there was very little space for intellectual struggle because the struggle was physical and the inmates were seen as nothing but biological mass to be disposed of, to say nothing of the tortures that were applied to the people. Another example, the English translation of which you can actually read, is the book The Torture Camp on Paradise Street by Stanislav Aseyev, who for three years lived in the prison called Isolatsia, created in Donetsk after it was occupied by the Russian armed forces. In his memoir, Aseyev shows how the administration of the prison were not really people who fought for ideas or wanted to fix society for the good in any way. The only thing they wanted, it seems, was to do the crimes themselves, to bring pain to people, to reduce them to non-existence. At this point we can see a contrast. On the one hand there is the physical totalitarianism and physical approach towards inmates as described by witnesses of the Soviet and Russian prisons, and on the other hand there is what we might call psychological totalitarianism, which postulates that the struggle between people and the system is of a purely intellectual kind. This myth of totalitarianism, along with the related idea of the mysterious Russian soul, seems to hide the real nature of the system. They try to convince you that when a crime happens, you shouldn't really blame the criminal because there is an idea behind the crime. Now, it doesn't mean that Dostoevsky's novel or Kostler's novel or Orwell's novel are completely wrong or shouldn't be read. No, they are quite good books with many great ideas which should be read and discussed, though sometimes those ideas seem to misunderstand and hide the real state of things, which is exactly what I tried to show in today's video. It was the Mimesis, I would be very happy to hear your thoughts in the comments, and see you next time.